We will now begin the long-awaited session five, which will discuss scientific innovation and its impact. Please welcome four distinguished speakers, and this session will be moderated by distinguished Professor Hyun Tae Kwan of Seoul National University. We'll receive questions from the audience in written form. Please raise your hand to submit your question, or if you need more question sheets. So good morning. My name is Tae Kwan Hyun from Seoul National University. For the U.S. delegate, my other job is I'm serving as a associate editor of Journal of the American Chemical Society. Okay, so you know, the, as you can see, compared to the last four sessions, you know, this session is uh, much more relaxed. You know, the, not that much like I mean the intense like uh, topics, you know, the serious topics like that. Uh, this session is uh, science, scientific innovation and its impact. And uh, the way we actually, you know, the proceed this session is going to be quite different. You know. All four speakers will with, uh, use PPT file, PowerPoint presentation files, which is quite different from previous sessions. And, uh, and also, as a presider and moderator, I'm not going to talk too much about it, okay? So, you know, the less, uh, uh, welcome, you know, Professor Kong Go, and he want to talk about uh, AI and the other like technology in the Chinese perspective. Please. At first, uh, at first, I like to uh, uh, say uh, thanks uh, to uh, uh, Chairman uh, Trey and uh, President Park for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, some technical issues here in this political forum, I believe. And my uh, title is AI is Emerging, uh, uh, which has to be uh, responsibly conducted with. The AI is Emerging, everybody, perhaps not everybody in the globe, but at least the people in our three countries are feeling the heat of AI. AI is merging into our life in work uh, environment to change uh, our life and our work uh, uh, paradigm. So, uh, but uh, AI, artificial intelligence, is not new. It has gone more than 80 years, uh, I would like to say, uh, a torturous uh, uh, way in the past uh, uh, 30 years. Here you see the people who were uh, uh, young uh, 60 years ago in Dartmouth uh, starting the summer project. And here you see the picture 50 years ago, uh, uh, they are getting old. But at that time, 2015, uh, 2005, they still suffer the winter of the artificial intelligence. Today, here you see the up and down, up and down, but uh, in, it is in recent years, with the help of internet, uh, the cloud computing, big data, and deep learning algorithm, AI has made significant breakthrough. Uh, some example of this breakthrough uh, I show here. Uh, one important, I believe, is that AI outperformed human in image recognition. Uh, that is a very famous worldwide competition uh, on the uh, image recognition uh, algorithm organized by uh, ImageNet. The ImageNet is a big data, uh, big database with tens of thousand marked pictures. And this competition started in uh, uh, 2010 and in that year in 2014, uh, <clears throat> the performance uh, of the AI on, in uh, image recognition is broke through the, the threshold line, which is 5% uh, failure, which is the human, uh, uh, human level. And later on, all teams used an algorithm called deep learning, and all of them breaks through the, bottle, uh, the, the, the threshold line and uh, have the lower uh, 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 failure than uh, 5%. So uh, this competition is now closed. It's, it's 
no meaning to continue this. And another example is that the Turing test has been passed in the year 2014. That is a, a it has a, 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 a Russian name, uh, Eugene Gustman, but made by Princeton uh, AI. It's an AI company not related to, to Princeton University. And this is a chatbot. It's a, a, a 13 years uh, old girl, and, and human cannot identify. Uh, more than uh, one third people cannot identify that as a robot. So this is the first time. Uh, uh, pass the uh, Turing uh, test. Turing has expected the Turing test should be passed uh, in the year around 2000, but uh, 14 years later. Uh, another interesting thing is a, a robot called uh, Torobo, uh, produced by a National Institute of Information in Japan, which has uh, set a goal of this robot is to pass uh, the uh, enrollment uh, examination of Todai, uh, uh, Tokyo University. Mm -hmm. uh, they take part of the uh, university examination in, in the year 2015 and has a quite good score, total score of 5,011, far beyond the average of 4,016. And he got uh, the score for the world history is 66. And for physics is 59, and for Japanese is about 50, and for English, his English is not good. <laughs> it's only uh, 36, and 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 that could be enrolled into 4, 000, uh, 400 private university and the 33 public universities, as reported by Japanese media. So. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Here, you know, uh, in, the 2000, uh, in 2016, uh, AlphaGo beats uh, uh, the, the best uh, Go player of uh, Korea, and uh, one year later, they beat the Chinese one. So, <clears throat> but, all, oh, <clears throat> but all of this uh, breakthrough uh, has not uh, 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 met the expectation of the AI developers. They still need to overcome many technical difficulties, uh, such as uh, <clears throat> their a strong data dependency. This is too strong. It is hard to get so many marked pictures like ImageNet. And this non-transferable. Uh, the AlphaGo is so good to play uh, Go, but he or she or it cannot uh, play chess. Uh, the chat robot, the Gooseman, can chat very well, but he could not play goals. And, and that, that's a problem. And uh, uh, thematic gaps. Uh, some AI system can listen, some can uh, uh, see, but they cannot uh, cross a semantic gap, multi, cross the multimedia uh, 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 sensing. And not explainable. That's a big, big uh, uh, problem for us to rely on the decision my, made by AI system. And finally, not the least, is the low efficiency uh, of energy. <clears throat> so despite all of this, AI is going out of the uh, laboratory and papers and getting into the people's living and working scenario. Uh, <clears throat> Here you see different kinds of robots in our life, in our everyday life, in our home, and in our uh, workplaces. And uh, <coughs> there is a, a surgery robot, uh, <coughs> which is widely used, quite widely used worldwide. And it made uh, uh, many operations in China. The first is made in, in the year uh, 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 2015 in May by an uh, uh, Italian uh, <coughs> doctor. And now they have made uh, about 100 uh, successful operations, but one failed in London last year. Uh, uh, the last year. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, the recognized AI as the emerging new protective force, it becomes core of 
many national development strategies. Here you see uh, from different countries. And uh, uh, this Monday, uh, President Trump has issued an uh, executive order uh, on the uh, American AI initiative. And the China has also uh, made the national uh, plan uh, guideline for the new generation of artificial intelligence development in China. And the Chinese uh, uh, plan consists of these six parts. And the important one is that we, we shortly we call it the one, two, three, four uh, plan for uh, new generation of the AI. One means building a open, collaborative, science technolo uh, technological innovation system including international uh, uh, collaborations. Two means to master the technical and the social dual features of the artificial intelligence. Three means to integrate research, application, and commercialization. Four means support scientific advancement, uh, economic development, people's welfare, and national security. So, the, the emphasis on uh, uh, research uh, will be uh, laid on the, uh, the application uh, emphasis is laid on the urban management, smart manufacturing, and public health. And the research is emphasized on the fundamental theory and the key technologies, which include data-driven AI group or cloud AI, human machine enhanced AI, cross-media sensed AI, and self-decision AI. Those are uh, the four uh, key uh, areas <coughs> in the Chinese guideline. So, <coughs> uh, and AI is also drawing wide public interest, attentions, and concerns. Uh, my institute is the new uh, think tank established by China Acad uh, Chinese Academy of Engineering. Uh, last year uh, in, in January. We, we, we have just uh, one year old. And uh, uh, last, last year uh, in the National Day, that's the 1st of October, my institute has made an online conversation uh, program to popularize the fundamental uh, knowledge of AI. Uh, the, the program is in the national holiday and at the dinner time. Surprisingly, there are about half a million people online to join the conversation. And the questions uh, they asked, most questions they asked, is about security. And they asked about, will AI become a tool to attack network or a tool to steal data of privacy? Will robots hurt people? Once robots get emotion, what will happen? when it uh, gets uh, a fury. Uh, how to uh, secure the robots work in a manner consistent with human ethics, and so on and so forth. They are concerned about this. And one uh, 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 young guy posed a question. It is that, is AI a wolf or a dog? When a wolf and dog are young, we cannot hardly to distinguish these two. But if we, we, we nurture them uh, 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 later, that, that, that's a war made dangerous to humankind. So these are not only concerned by Chinese people, but uh, by all mankind uh, of the Earth. Last year, in October uh, 24th, uh, science has issued a paper analyzing AI's ethical challenges in terms of delegation and responsibility visibility and influence, translational ethics, and so on and so forth. The conclusion is that a coordinated efforts by civil society, politics, business, and academia will help to identify and pursue the best strategies to make AI a force for good and unlock its potential to force the human uh, flourishing uh, while respecting human uh, dignity. Uh, <coughs> let me uh, uh, <coughs> end uh, with some uh, 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 proposals. I think uh, 
Because we have common concern of humankind, that calls for joint efforts. First, we should get a consensus on AI ethical principles. And then we're going to collaboratively uh, studying on how to convert these consensus to po policies, rules, laws, codes, and so on and so forth. And then setting technical standards to ensure this ethical requirement to be effectively embedded into AI system and could be tested and verified. Finally, we should educating people who design, manufacturing, selling, and using AI, how to responsible conduct with AI. So <clears throat> just before the pass away of the great uh, scientist, uh, 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 Stephen Hawking, he has delivered a speech on the Global Mobile Congress he chose the, the title Guiding AI to Benefit Humanity and the Environment. He uh, made a, 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 a statement to say uh, the rise of powerful AI will be, neither, uh, will be either the best thing or the worst ever happened to humanity. We should do all we can to ensure that its future development benefits us and our environment. We join together to call for support of international treaties to ob obviate the rise of uncontrollable AI. I stop here, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Yoon Kim. Actually, uh, Dr. Kim just moved back to Korea, joining the SKT, uh, SK Telecom, Telecom as uh, AI like uh, center director. And before then, actually, he worked five years at Apple. And actually, he's a developer of a city, as you know, city. So you know, the, actually, he also going to talk about uh, AI. Please. Well, thank you, Professor Hyun, and, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's my distinct honor and privilege to uh, speak to you about a very important technical topic, and it also is very um, uh, telling for me to be uh, a representative uh, of the technology world, of building technology. I'm an engineer by training. I majored in speech recognition technology, and I had never imagined 20 years ago when I was a grad student at Stanford that I will be standing or sitting here and uh, talking to you all about uh, artificial intelligence and its impact to society and uh, humankind. I've titled the talk um, of my presentation uh, as The Jekyll and Hyde, and I think it's probably um, very analogous to the wolf versus dog analogies, and also the best or the worst case um, technology scenario that um, Dr. Stephen Hawking talked about. Um, first, I'd like to define what artificial intelligence is for the context of my talk and hopefully our discussions afterwards. So here's how I see it. This is a very subjective definition. It is a set of computer software and machine hardware technologies that try to mimic or simulate human intelligence and behavior so that the objective would be to help humans get things done more quickly, accurately, efficiently, safely, and naturally. Now, um, as Professor Gong mentioned, uh, the, uh, AI um, started in the uh, mid-1950s, and when it started, it was basically a rule-based AI where humans programmed rules for machines to follow, a very deterministic input and output. Then I think uh, the advent of data, computing, and certain algorithms such as deep learning in the mid-2000s uh, have driven uh, what I call the era of narrow AI or data-driven AI for the past 10 years. And we are all very excited and also very uh, worried and scared and fearful of the next phase of AI, which is called general AI or artificial general intelligence or AGI, where without even human labels, uh, machines start to learn from unsupervised data uh, and learns how to do different tasks and new tasks over time. And then obviously a lot of people think that coinciding with general AI, there will be superhuman AI, where AI um, basically outperforms humans in very critical, important tasks, even the world's best experts.
So the end, AI, really, is this our final invention, as some people are um, arguing? Um, we might, may not see these scenarios where robots talk to each other and uh, lament over their firing in our lifetime. Um, but what we may see is basically a hype cycle, like what Gardner proposes, of emerging technologies, when technologies get a lot of interest and a lot of excitement, and then they basically uh, realize and uh, be extremely disappointed on its limitations, and then after that trough of disillusionment uh, comes a period of uh, maturation. Um, I've, uh, you can't see this, so I've actually labeled a couple of points that are relevant for this discussion. One is deep learning, which is basically the algorithm that's propelling AI's commercialization. That's at the peak of the hype curve, which means that that was summer of 2018, and I've been uh, mentioning a potential third AI winter <laughs> to uh, our societies. And so it is at the brink. It's on the brink of actually going uh, through that. And uh, the trough of disillusionment is not, and disappointment is not far away. The second is uh, among the AI technologies and applications, one of the most difficult and challenging is for machines to understand human speech, not just recognize human speech and turn speech into text, but also derive and understand and infer the underlying intent of humans. Uh, so that's very difficult. And uh, that conversational AI platform, uh, according to this graph, is, has a little dark blue circle, which means it's about five to 10 years away from reaching commercial um, generalizations. And then uh, 10 years and beyond, or um, maybe never, uh, there's a lot of debate on this, is the so-called artificial general AI, where AI starts to understand and learn and improve even without human supervision. So that's where we are right now. Um, so uh, I'd like to, to um, present maybe my summarization of where we are with AI in 2019. Commercial AI deployments uh, are mostly powered by the steep learning algorithms in speech and image processing, and I'll go over, over some examples later on. Um, AI outperforms or rivals humans in certain tasks, such as the one that Professor Gong has uh, introduced to us. And explosion of narrow AI, or weak AI, where AI has been trained by a large amount of data to do certain tasks, but only those certain tasks very well, have proliferated and have exploded uh, into commercializing and empowering various domains and verticals, such as the ones that you see here. Um, I just want to, to share a couple of, ex a few examples of where we are with respect to commercial AI deployments that are being used in the real world. One is identifying, identifying cars and makes and models and license plates, and perhaps even criminals or uh, people of interest driving those cars. And they have to do it in, in very high speed in environments where you are driving through a highway. Another is, the, again, the explosion uh, of so-called conversational AI assistants or virtual digital assistants such as Siri that um, started in 2011. Uh, 2010 was when Siri was uh, acquired as a startup. 2011 is, was when it was introduced to the world via the iPhone 4S event. And then after that, Google and, and Amazon uh, took suit. Uh, SK Telecom, actually, very surprisingly, I learned, uh, it launched its own smart speaker in 2016. And I was involved with a project at Apple to launch the uh, smart speaker of its own called Apple HomePod. And that came out early last year. So again, speech recognition and conversational interfaces, uh, especially uh, with the smart speakers, have really uh, been popularized. I don't know uh, whether uh, the popularization was, uh, was successful. I think that there are a lot of limited use cases still. And um, if you can't see, and if you can't um, touch, if you can't really um, understand what's going on, and if you can just only listen and speak, these devices obviously have physical limitations. Um, another area beyond speech recognition is actually image synthesis. And as you can see, um, the, the two middle columns are uh, images that were synthesized or morphed by AI. And um, right now, uh, these types of synthetic images are really creating a lot of excitement, but also a lot of fear and anxiety, because if you consider the Turing test of image synthesis, where humans are asked to look at an image and determine whether those images were created by human beings or whether they were um, 
manifested and synthesized by AI, not a lot of people would succeed in uh, understanding and discerning these things. And so this is a cause of, for, for real concern. Also, moving images, you can actually make horses, now zebras. Uh, and this is an area of active interest in research for entertainment and other types of augmented reality applications, but also it has ramifications that are, I think Laura and others will, will uh, tend to. Um, uh, this is uh, audio generation. So now we could use snippets of audio um, from certain known people and certain lay people, laymen, to create um, a speech synthesis engine. This is, hopefully the audio will come out right, but this is a President Trump voice, um, just trained with a couple hours of data that they were able to extract from the internet, and they made a synthesis engine. So let's listen to uh, President Trump's synthetic voice. My name is Donald Trump. It never learned Korean, but news opinions makes me to speak Korean. It prepared this technology to meet North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Look forward to our meeting. See you guys soon. The airman Donald Trump in Mida. Then in Hangover, Bill and Jerky of Sail. Girl and News of Pian Stuff with a Hangover, Harsley Kidio Sail. Who can I read up Kim Jong-un and when I disagree with his word to be as Mida? So it's quite timely that we have this particular demo. This was made last year, so they have made improvements. This is a startup company in Korea called Neo Sapiens, who makes uh, synthesis engines from very small amount of data. They have, actually have other applications such as personal TTS, being able to preserve certain voices of people before they're just, uh, they, uh, are, um, they pass away. Uh, and actually, uh, last year I heard a I heard a demo of the late uh, Che Jong Yun chairman's voice. Uh, we were able to synthesize that voice and um, and use it in a demo. So there are certain uh, again there are certain excitements around this technology. Here's another example. Uh, uh, Morgan Freeman. My name is Morgan Freeman. Name and Morgan Freeman. I never learned Korean, but Neo Sapiens makes me to speak Korean. Nan and Handlebar have been on Japanese. Pura Neo Sapiens and Opening Handlebar has seeked us media. I prepare this technology to discuss business opportunities in interactive media. Interactive media will be a key to the future of the world. Please commercialize this technology with many partners. Man and partner to buy the future of the world. I look forward to the next step. I'll provide the media. Thank you. I'm sorry, So they basically took Morgan Freeman's voice and uh, actually uh, added affective computing and prosody, and also took the little linguistic units in English uh, called phonemes, uh, basically consonants and vowels, and they repurposed it for Korean. Same with Trump. Uh, technologies will get better and better. I don't really want to agree with what Morgan or Morgan's synthetic voice is saying is, is excitement around commercializing this because I think we need to be very careful. But anyway, um, this is, these are examples of audio generation and it's, it's only gonna get better. Um, and then obviously this. Meet Amazon's newest holiday workers, the Kiva robots. At this fulfillment center in Tracy, California, more than 3,000 of them cruise the warehouse floor, helping. So this is basically an old video. It's not even state of the art. Um, it's warehouse automation. These robots now will have arms and perhaps legs and other types of, uh, of gadgetry to do more things than just roll around and uh, help with warehouse automation. So um, with all these in mind, and maybe you can now ex extrapolate of what's gonna happen, I wanna talk about the Jekyll, um, the dark side. So there are risks of AI. Uh, that are being used, uh, for instance, in this case, where uh, image recognition deep learning based AI classifier classified the, uh, the photos of these two individuals, one on the left, um, it thought that it had low risk of repeated crimes, and the other on the right, high risk. Well, it turned out that the left, uh, the person on the left had, both had two petty theft arrests, but it had the prior offenses were, were armed robberies and attempted armed robberies, and um, unfortunately, this person went on to commit uh, subsequent offenses, offenses, whereas the person on the right um, actually had four juvenile misdemeanors and had no subsequent offenses. So if 
uh, government authorities uh, and law enforcement authorities uh, rely on AI that have biased data in the terms of perhaps it does not have a lot of African American um, images of those, um, uh, those sector or those demographics in its database, then it'll make mistakes either way. Uh, this poses a lot of risks in terms of our overall decision making. There's also security risks, and I'm very glad that Doc, uh, Professor Gong mentioned that um, even folks in China, the, their biggest worry is, is risks. Again, deep learning based algorithms can basically um, outperform humans in image recognition, as Professor Gong mentioned. But if you perturb an image, and to the human, naked human eye, they basically are the same, they are identical. But numerically, they're different. The pixel values are slightly changed. And look what happens uh, to the um, recognition results. On the left, with no perturbation, the original, it successfully recognizes that it's a tabby cat. With a slightly perturbed image that is imperceivable to the human eye, uh, it thinks it's guacamole, which is a Mexican food. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, and it is even green, it has some green eyes, but certainly not, doesn't resemble guacamole. And the more disturbing thing is it actually does this with 99% confidence. It's extremely confident that this image on the right is guacamole. So these are relatively benign and, and rather you know, cute examples of, of how deep learned AI can have biases and uh, commit mistakes. But if you can imagine a lot more mission critical tasks where our AI is fooled by um, attempts to attack it, then you might uh, imagine what the, the consequences and the ramifications and risks and threats uh, that can be imposed. So why is Mr. Elon Musk afraid of AlphaGo Zero? I don't know because I'm not afraid of AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero is the world's best uh, player, bar none, in terms of AlphaGo. It beats AlphaGo, who beat Issa Dole and other leaders by 100 to zero but it can only play AlphaGo. I think what Elon Musk is afraid of is not necessarily AlphaGo zero per se, but the advent and advances in, in artificial general intelligence where AlphaGo zero now learns how to play chess and learns how to play board games and learn how to play poker and is able to bluff very, very effectively and, and so on and so forth. Um, that's what we're afraid of. Um, I'm actually more afraid of uh, the global AI race and I know that there are people who say that the AI arms race and arms race in general uh, are not gonna happen. I am one uh, that wanna believe that it, it may happen. There, there, there is a much higher probability of um, individuals uh, and states and groups of people who use the advances in, in AI, especially the powerful general AI, to wreak havoc and to um, really use it for purposes other than for the benefit of humankind. So that was the Jekyll. Now we'll, we'll look at the, um, the more of the, uh, the brighter side of AI. So it's human-centered AI. And um, uh, the, 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 the thesis here is that humans have to be in the center of any AI development because humans have quite unique character and aspects and traits that machines can never be able to imitate uh, or simulate. Um, okay. Maybe not. <laughs> and machines, uh, although we will come up with many different algorithms, uh, will still be machines. So we do need a, a human intervention and help. The way, one of the ways that I've been working uh, from industry is to enable this human-machine coevolution through experiences and products and services that feature AI. This is an example of the um, Amazon Go store that is not manned. Uh, but it is served, you know, it's, it's uh, offered by AI technologies to know and figure out what you bought so that it's convenient for the customer at the expense of, again, surveillance and other aspects that we need to be careful of. And the last piece is together. So it's humans, machines, and through experiences, learning together and co-evolving. Uh, one example of togetherness or uh, humans and machines collaborating is this area called computational creativity where the machine surveys, uh, for its, in this example, images of chairs uh, and designs of chairs and uh, no single human being can ever uh, survey the entire internet to consume and understand and try to analyze all these um, 
images of chairs, but AIs and machines can because they're repetitive and they're dumb and they can be smart if humans allow them. So after that is done, um, we have a human-machine collaborative design where the, the machine first comes up with um, neural network-based uh, samples of chairs that uh, perhaps are guided by humans and the humans get inspired by that design and makes the rest of the design process uh, complete with, again, their own creativities and, and then a product emerges from that collaboration. Um, so um, I think that, again, the, the bright side of AI is humans and machines through experiences that are very commercially valuable as well as, well, as, well as socially valuable uh, co-evolve together. Now, is this always going to be the case? What about the other dark side? Isn't that going to happen? And the answer is yes. That's why we have to be cognizant of these two sides of AI. And uh, I think that there needs to be extremely active and collaborative effort from people who develop and make these technologies and, and people who then invest in these technologies and deploy them to officials in the government and other people who make policies and facilitate them and intervene to educational institutions uh, and even uh, individually as, as uh, uh, responsible consumers and end users of AI. We all have to be responsible for making sure that this picture that I present is indeed the dominant picture as opposed to the darker side. Uh, thank you very much. So you know, the, we, we heard uh, two speeches by you know, Professor Kong and Dr. Kim on the AI and uh, that kind of stuff. Next, uh, we're going to move on a slight different like, topics. The next speaker is Laura Manley. From, uh, she's actually director of the Technology and Public Purpose Project at the Harvard Kennedy School, Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs. Laura, please. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. All right, my name is Laura Manley, and, and like you said, I'm the, the director of the Technology and Public Purpose Project. We're based at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. The project works to ensure that emerging technologies are both developed and managed in ways that serve the public good. The TAP project is led by former Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. And in fact, when I showed him the list of the folks that would be here at this conference, he was quite disappointed that he wasn't able to make it. And he wanted to let you all know that he's learned a tremendous amount from the people in this room and sends his best. I'd like to start off with a message from the secretary that frames both our work and the talk I'm about to give. When I began my career in elementary particle physics, the great figures who taught and inspired me had been part of the Manhattan Project generation that developed the atomic bomb. They were proud to have created a disruptive technology that ended World War II and deterred a third world war through more than 50 years of tense east-west standoff. They were also proud to have made nuclear power possible. But their understanding of the underlying technology also gave them a deep regard for the awesome, unavoidable risks that came with those technologies. As a consequence, they dedicated themselves to inventing in parallel the technologies behind arms control and nuclear reactor safety. By working on both the bright opportunities and the complex dilemmas of technological innovation, these scientists tried to round out its effect on humanity. They recognized that the advance of knowledge is inevitable, but it needs to be steered in the direction of public good. Technologists in my generation understood that we had an opportunity and an obligation to use our knowledge in the service of civic life and public purpose. Technologists today have that same obligation, and society is in need of practical, analytically driven solutions to the problems that arise in connection with fast-paced technological change. Such solutions will emerge only if the new generation of young tech innovators is encouraged and inspired to assume civic responsibilities that come with creating changes of great consequence. Today, I'd like to talk to you specifically about tech innovation and how we can ensure that progress continues with humanity in mind. I'll start with a story from history. In the year 1880, the US Census Bureau estimated it would take approximately eight years to process all the data collected from the year's census. Furthermore, with the growing population, they estimated that the 1890 census would take over 10 years to process. So in the late 1880s, a young engineer, 
Herman Hollerith created a tabulating machine using punch cards. He was inspired by conductors using holes to punch in different positions on a railway ticket to record travel details like gender and approximate age. This reduced the 10 years work to three months and he's known as a father of modern automated computation. The company he founded would go on to become IBM. Thanks. So why do I start with a story? Many times when we talk about tech, we immediately think of AI, robots, blockchain, things of the past few decades. However, technological innovation and progress is not specific to today. In fact, according to Oxford Dictionary, technology can be defined as the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Throughout each time in history, technological innovation have had supporting conditions and norms that were unique to that time. For Hollerith, there were several conditions that supported his innovation, in two in particular. There was an industry trend moving towards mechanical tools and devices to automate tasks, and there was an increasing use of electromechanical relays to count and sort. These supporting conditions and norms, along with many others, helped lay the foundation for his tabulating innovation. So if phases of technological progress and innovation have been facilitated by specific supporting conditions, what are the conditions of today? The conditions that have supported the rapid innovation ecosystem in the past few decades in particular have been the exponential increase of digital data, the ubiquity of mobile interfaces and increases in process processing capabilities, and the growing power of AI. However, what I'd like to talk to you about today is the norms of today's tech innovation. While the technological conditions are today are quite remarkable in and of themselves, I believe that the norms of today will be of equal consequence. These norms dictate behaviors that give power to the technological conditions and advancements. There are three interrelated norms of today's tech innovation that we've identified through our research. First, the accelerationist tech culture. Second, the understanding of specific users. And third, the application of values and priorities into tech innovations and products. So I'll review each one. Has anyone heard of this phrase? Everything that is not forbidden is allowed. It originally comes from English law as a constitutional principle. This concept is a deep and underlying part of the culture of tech innovation and exploration. The converse principle, which is more closely associated with European law, is that Everything that is not allowed is forbidden. So at much of the tech ecosystem's core, the concept of experimentation, innovation, and pushing the boundaries is a defining characteristic of this moment in tech history and culture. So what does that concept look like in practice, and, and what happens when you add an element of speed? Many times, and particularly in recent years with the tech industry, we move fast and break things. We've heard the phrases like Facebook's original motto, which eventually changed to move fast, build things, and then stable infrastructure, then just move fast. We've heard fail fast, fail early. Innovation, speed, and growth have almost always been central to Silicon Valley's self-conception. The founder of Y Combinator, one of the industry's most influential startup accelerators, believes that speed and growth literally define a startup. His 2012 essay, Startup Equals Growth, has become a sort of manifesto for tech entrepreneurs. He wrote, the only essential thing is rapid growth. Everything else we associate with startups follows from growth. We know the benefits of rapid growth and innovation. The sacred unicorn status for the fastest startup billion dollar valuation, the ability to get an edge over other players in increasingly competitive industries, or the effective utilization of scarce resources to find the winning solution. Here on the screen is the company Bird who hit the $1 billion market in well under a year. But what are the downsides of rapid innovation without boundaries? Uber, the ride sharing company, is a prime example of a company that was so growth and speed oriented that it led to its public unraveling. Uber was known for being careless with user data, pushing aggressively into new markets, and launching new self-driving cars, 
despite calls for better research. As a result, Uber has been thrust into damage control mode over the past several years. The CEO was ousted, they've been sued by Waymo, and they've had dozens of setback in crucial foreign markets. This has deeply affected the company's value and public image, not to mention the countless compromises in customer data and safety. When we're moving so fast that we don't consider the potential unintended impacts of our products, we often miss very important things that may not be worth the price of rapid innovation. Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn and partner at Greylock, just released a book called Blitzscaling. It talks about the lightning fast path to building and scaling a multi-million dollar company. But recently, Reid and Joey Ito, a leading technologist from MIT, had a conversation about moving fast but not breaking things. Ito said, with Blitzscaling, the need for speed and growth is trying to simplify things by just moving very fast. But some things can't be reduced and simplified, like fairness and ethics. If bad values are set at the beginning of a company that blitz scales, the DNA of that toxicity will pervade everything. Parts of culture that are harder to change get set in early stages, and the problem with technology is that it really accel uh, accelerates you in the direction that you're already going. Another norm of today's tech innovation is the emphasis on tailored products to specific users, leading to unprecedented new levels of convenience. Much of this has been driven by the human-centered design community and the increasing demands for products to be highly personalized. Tailoring products and services to the needs of users helps ensure that new technologies are filling a critical unmet need. Who could argue with greater convenience? So what's the greater context for this and how does it impact the way technologies are developed and used? When many technologies are designed, they're often developed with a very specific type of user in mind. For example, Lyrebird, a company from Canada, develops voice cloning technology. Their innovation will allow you to clone your voice in less than a minute with almost 100% accuracy. On their website, they say this technology is specifically for developers to continue the speech synthesis development field. In a recent interview, they were asked, what might a different user do with this type of product? Have you considered how it might be used by other people for identity theft, fraud, or, or worse? Their response was, quote, we developed it with good intentions to help advance the field. We want people to do good things with our technology, and even if we didn't develop it, someone else would have anyway. The common analogy that we use for this mindset is that no one wants to admit when their baby is ugly. We mean that it's very difficult for many technologists and entrepreneurs to imagine how their technology that was developed with good intentions for specific users might actually be used for bad or hostile purposes. Who could have imagined Thank you. Who could have imagined that what started in a small Harvard dorm room so students could make friends could lead to what Facebook is today. Just a few months ago, the New York Times published an article talking about how Facebook was used by members of the Myanmar military over the past decade to target minority groups and spread hate. Now let me add an important caveat here. When Henry Ford first invented the automobile, there's no way he could have anticipated climate change and global warming. In that same vein, Zuckerberg could have never imagined the human impact of what he was developing in his dorm room. However, as a company or a technology or any innovation grows and evolves, we can take proactive measures to consider how users may have changed and evaluate if tweaks need to be made to the product or if safeguards should be put into place. There are also scenarios that are much more obvious, like Lyrebird, where you can proactively consider how other people beyond your target audience might utilize your technology. The last norm of today's tech innovation ecosystem is the integration of tech innovators' values and priorities into the products and companies they're developing. A founder's values and priorities have always driven how a product or startup is designed, but in recent years, and as technologies have become more complex, we're seeing the tech community's underlying values put on display as we began using their devices in our everyday and sometimes every hourly interactions. 
Some of these decisions are obvious statements that a tech company or developer puts out, such as user privacy or fair labor practices. But some of these value-based decisions are less obvious and many times happen unknowingly, such as the tweaking of an algorithm, the creation of a setting, or the standard for data collection. What's the problem? Well, everyone's values and priorities are different. So as a consumer, do you have transparency into which values and priorities the technologies you're using espouse and make decisions based on? As a developer or a tech company leader, are you aware of the baked in implicit or explicit values your priority, your technology promotes? As a policymaker, do you intervene and create values and priorities that the tech industry must follow? And if so, what are those values? So what does this actually look like in practice? Algorithms are fundamental infrastructure of machine learning and more broadly, artificial intelligence. Algorithms that may conceal hidden biases are already routinely used to make financial, legal decisions in countries around the world. Proprietary algorithms are used to decide, for instance, who gets a job interview, who gets granted parole, who gets a loan. However, as we develop advanced tools and algorithms to make decisions that are the underlying foundation of our societies, we need to carefully examine the values and priorities we had in mind. Do the choices that we are making as we develop an algorithm, for example, lead to the type of society we want to live in? And just because an algorithm decision might be accurate, does that mean it's fair? It can be easy to say, well, the algorithm's biased, but even though our machines are learning, we are the ones teaching it. This has led to some companies setting policies that undervalue issues such as privacy of their users or rights of their workers in pursuit of other goals such as free expression and universal access to their platforms. Recently, the tech industry has been faced with some very difficult decisions that have trade-offs in both ways, like national security versus personal privacy. What would you do? Apple's a good example of a company that's dealt with this type of dilemma. When asked to create backdoors for their products to support national security investigations, Apple spoke out. One of the company's US priorities is individual privacy and security. As we've seen recently in the news, other companies have not been as deliberate with their values on individual privacy. Another example of a company who's led with their values is Mozilla Firefox. Mozilla clearly states in their mission that it's designed to promote a free internet accessible to all that pu puts people's privacy first. So when you choose to use Mozilla Firefox versus Google Chrome versus Neighbor, do you as a consumer know the difference in what you're opting into? As a society, we've leveraged the conditions and norms of technological innovation to do amazing things. It's now up to us to make sure we can take action to mitigate the risks and unintended consequences of these technologies to ensure the net effect is positive. To that end, we've launched the TAP project, a collaboration between Harvard, MIT, and Stanford. Our mission is to ensure that emerging tech is developed and managed in ways that serve the public good. The secretary uses the word public purpose because we believe the dilemmas of emerging technologies are not only going to be solved by policymakers, but need to include industry, technologists, lawyers, and civil society. We focus on dimensions of public purpose, such as fairness, reliability, safety, inclusivity, transparency, and accountability. Our work is based on several underlying premises. Technology is neutral. Solutions must be technically informed. Policy making and regulation must be developed inclusively, and we must enlist the next generation. Through our research, we've identified several leverage points to proactively integrate public purpose along the tech development process, from basic science all the way to ongoing management and production. Our leverage points attempt to ensure technologies are developed with public purpose in mind with two approaches. One, proactive design and evaluation of societal impacts, and two, accountability mechanisms. These leverage points include tech ethics trainings for computer scientists and engineers before these technologies are even developed, grant funding requirements on emerging tech projects to evaluate ethical considerations, tools for startups and accelerators to evaluate potential societal risks to their technologies, 
and increased institutional support and training for government decision makers on technical topics. As we continue our research, I welcome your thoughts as we develop this approach. This is a conversation the international community needs to have. Many of the emerging technologies that have been mentioned over the past two days affect us all as a global community, regardless of geographic boundaries. Some of these technologies have already been developed and released to the market, while others are close behind. Human genome manipulation is a scientific breakthrough that affects us all. Quantum computing may break traditional computing and cryptography paradigms around the world. And geoengineering, for example, may fundamentally alter the course of our wor world's climate. These technologies, regardless of where they're developed or released, shape all of our countries and impact all of our lives. Therefore, it's essential that we establish an ongoing dialogue of experts from the US, China, and Korea, and many other countries to decide on the ethical bounds and potential impacts on humanity of these emerging technologies. The question is not, what can these technologies do? The question is, what should they do? And as the Secretary stated in his message, we stand to greatly benefit from the amazing innovations of technological change. But that technology desperately requires us to shape it for the good of humanity. Thank you. So final speaker for this last session is uh, Professor Chung Wong Lee. He's professor at Seoul National University. And actually, like uh, after I invited him to join this uh, session, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, he was uh, appointed as a special advisor to Korean uh, president in the, in the area of economy and science technology. Please, Professor Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very much delighted to be here to share uh, some of the potentials of new technology such as AI. Uh, and I expect you all enjoyed uh, the great presentation from uh, tech people about all the beautiful technological, uh, the uh, technicalities of AI. So I wanted to take a little different uh, angles uh, to check whether the uh, Korean industry or society is well prepared to accommodate all those potential uh, the benefit of AI. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, I wanted to take a little longer uh, time frame uh, to check uh, the, uh, the current economy. So first of all, I wanted to share this picture uh, to show the growth history of Korean industrial uh, development from 60s. And if we set the world average GDP per capita as 100, then we can see that the Korean economy has started its economic development from just one-tenth of world average, now reaching more than three times than the world average. Uh, so much dramatic uh, progress in its fact. But uh, very recently we all, uh, we have been observing some dark-sided side of the uh, Korean development uh, process. Uh, on top of all evidence, we can uh, see steady slowing down of gross rate of GDP per capita. A couple of weeks ago, a large number of think tanks announced their estimate of this year's economic growth rate and maybe uh, there's some kind of consensus uh, on the level of 2.6 or 2.7. Uh, but more important point I wanted to indicate is the uh, unchanging export portfolios. For the last uh, more than 10 years, we can see shipbuildings, DRAMs, and, and chemicals on top of the list of export items. And we have very limited number of unicorns. The, maybe we have different estimate, but the, uh, we have around four to six only unicorns out of 1,000 one uh, unicorns in the world. And also, we have very low level of uh, uh, share of new companies, newly created companies, startups. So it means the metabolism of uh, uh, the industry 
the creative destruction has not uh, maybe occurred uh, strongly. And also, uh, including SK. So we have very uh, uh, kind of uh, fixed rankings. So SK and, and Samsung and LG. Uh, so all these evidences uh, indicated that uh, the current economy uh, may be slow, uh, may be down, growth rate, and also the uh, maybe fail to accommodate new challenges. So in we have now we have two pictures. Uh, in the long long term, we have a great uh, the uh, uh, growth histories, but on the other hand, for the last uh, 10 years, the uh, growth rate has been slowing down. How can we understand these two pictures in one framework? So in order to do that, I wanted to uh, share the concept of innovation capability. So there are two different types of innovation capability. For example, in order to make one do products, we need to, first, we need to have a design. But secondly, we need to implement the, the design. So we can say there are two different types of company, company A, maybe which can only implement the, the adopted design, and company B, for example, uh, like Apple's, the company who, uh, which can design as well as to uh, implement. So uh, the, the point I wanted to share with you is that uh, in the very early days of economic development, including Korea in the 60s and 70s, the, the country would start with only implementation capabilities with adopted design from advanced countries. The uh, way to adopt the design from uh, domestic countries are, are quite diverse, from uh, by maybe licensing, or even in some cases by reverse engineering. But anyhow, there are two different uh, the strategies. In the very early stage, implementation capability can play a big role, but in the later stage, concept design capability we need to have. <coughs> But in between, from implementation to design capability, it, it might be very difficult to, to change its capability paradigms. So uh, if we look back uh, into our uh, economic development history, we can say that Korean economy has been very successful by uh, <coughs> the adopting implementation capability heavily with mature technologies and with only the very important criteria of efficiency and speed and try our best to minimize the try and error uh, and also the basic uh, the methodology to improve the implement capabilities learning by doing, doing doing the same thing again and again and then to improve the efficiency uh, but as we all enjoyed the presentations, uh, the, in order to make a new design, in order to accommodate a high-tech, unproven new ideas, we need to have a little different criteria, such as we need to have challenging, a little differentiated target, and also we need to have uh, networks to share the try and error. And also we need to have a kind of a culture to accumulate try and error for a long time. And also we need to have a kind of strategy so-called small bettings. So that's why uh, uh, we call uh, fast fail as kind of mantra of uh, Silicon Valley. But uh, if we are too much stuck in implementation capability, then it might be very difficult to move ourselves to into a design capability-based culture. 
So that's why we are experiencing a growth stall. So now, if we can define the current, the, uh, the basic paradigms of Korean industrial uh, structure as implementation capability, then the most important keyword we have to uh, focus on is try and error, accumulation and try and error. But as you all uh, imagine, it's very difficult to change its paradigm because national internet system is kind of a combination of all self institutions, rural games, such as finance systems, fine and education systems, in, in the in labor uh, relations. All those social systems has been stuck focusing on implementation to minimize trend error. So it means all the society should change at the same time. So that's why it is very difficult. So it means even though we can see a great potential of AI and high technology, but that technology itself cannot maybe have uh, it, uh, its kind of a, uh, adequate role in the society if all these subsequent complementary institutions may not change. Uh, so I wanted to uh, suggest some kind of keyword as a, a form of innovation commons, is, uh, I named commons, because we can share all these keywords. First, uh, just think about the potential of AI in the Korean economy. It's not possible right now, but in order to uh, maybe get, maybe, uh, enjoy all the benefits, then first we need to have very strong manufacturing base because all bits information should meet anyhow atoms. And secondly, we need to change the educational platform paradigms from education to lifelong learnings, from education to learning. And secondly, we need to tolerate try and error, so change the culture. And lastly, not only corporations, company, but also government should all change, but not the uh, Ministry of Industry or Ministry of Science and Technology, but all the ministries, department should change all together at the same time. That's why we need a strong leadership. And so uh, my conclusion is that there is, is a definitely a good potential of AI, but maybe my uh, temporary uh, evaluation uh, is that the current society and industrial structure is not well prepared, not well prepared enough. So we need this kind of a comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the all four speakers for the wonderful presentation and the bring up some key issues in the technology and uh, and the its impa impact. So you know, the, let's move on to have. Uh, you know, some discussion session, and uh, I mean, and in the floor, if you have any question, just to hand over the questionnaire. There is a the piece of paper, so you, know, you can just uh, fill out the forms and uh, just, I mean, the hand over to the staff members around here, so so that uh, you know, okay, we can discuss this this later. Let me first start with the easy questions. You know, I'm professor and also I'm scientist. So you know, the, I mean. If I, I'm not here uh, in my office, what I'm going to do is I just read the papers, recent papers, and try to get new research idea. So what I'm afraid of actually is this is uh, probably a question to I mean Professor Gong and uh, Dr. Kim. So you mentioned about the, especially I mean Dr. Kim, you mentioned about the superhuman AI, right, in the last stage and final stage of AI. So what I'm worried about is uh, AI become that level, and uh, I'm gonna lose my job. So what I mean is, uh, I mean, the, I mean, AI becomes creative enough, and uh, you know, the, 
you know, AI want to bring up with a, a lot better idea than I can do. All right. So, you know, the, is it, is it going to, that kind of thing going to happen? So, you know, the, and if it happens, wh when it going to happen? That's what, what's your, I mean, two of your opinion. Well, before I uh, offer and share my views, I want to personally thank uh, President Park in Guk for inviting me to this panel. It's been quite fun and interesting and engaging. Um, it's a very convoluted set of questions. Um, I think that in the near future, no. Uh, in the near future, there could be uh, AI that actually improves AI. So AI making AI learn better. But the current state of AI is quite weak and narrow as I've uh, presented to you. It only can do certain tasks very well with uh, more sets of data that humans label and instruct and supervise. So um, a good example of that is uh, something called meta AI or automatic machine learning, where a lot of researchers uh, in the field of AI, actually the high caliber ones, spend a lot of time trying to experiment with different data sets to come up with the best neural network architecture and the best parameters to increase accuracy for a certain given task. And now we're seeing the advent of the so-called AI teaching AI, automatic methods to, to produce machine learned models that are uh, not as easy to come by by humans. They need to spend a lot of time and effort and, and a lot of trial and error. So that's automation. I don't think that's creativity. And I, I certainly don't think that it's, is uh, something that you should be worried about, especially Professor Yun, <laughs> given your, um, your expertise and your, your, uh, your caliber of research. I think that what may happen, though, is scientists and engineers alike, and even designers, as I I've, as I've mentioned in the computational creativity case, may be helped or assisted by AI producing different types of experimental results that may inspire uh, the expert of experts to come up with new techniques. And that's already happening, and that's why you see all these different AI conferences um, uh, attracting a lot of different talent from different fields. And I, I see that happening in the next five, 10 years where AI can definitely help humans to advance the field of AI. W when it comes to artificial general intelligence though, uh, I've heard estimates of 30 to 40 years uh, from now. Uh, but again, I, I think that that's also very, very difficult because the rate of growth of technology versus the breakthrough of when a breakthrough might happen. So what is the next breakthrough after deep learning? It's different, it's very difficult to gauge. I do know though that the, the rate of growth for deep learning is only gonna accelerate. So for the next couple of years, we will see a massive explosion of deep learning based AI technologies um, penetrating different industries and societies. I agree with Kim, uh, because uh, in the near future, you, you don't need to worry about uh, the super uh, AI, because uh, this uh, uh, far beyond the, the capability of today's technology. But uh, talking about uh, the employed uh, rate, uh, which is influenced by AI, that's true, but I think AI is not uh, just to deprive the jobs of the human being, but create a lot of new uh, jobs for the human being. This is just a change the structure uh, of the job uh, uh, distribution. Uh, last year, I have uh, uh, visited some uh, factory in the western part of China. It's the province called uh, uh, Guizhou. It's a poor province, and there is. A, it's a big room like this, even bigger than this. 100 people uh, sitting in this room in front of the, com uh, the de desktop computer. And they doing, uh, 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 the marking the, the pictures. Uh, these are uh, uh, farmers, uh, young farmers. They uh, gather it uh, from the, the tedious, uh, 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 very uh, uh, the hard working uh, from outside and get into the room with the air condition. And, and I have asked, do you uh, uh, earn more money? They, they told me, almost the same, mm -hmm. but much better uh, working conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the hundreds of people. Uh, and I asked, how many people are doing this kind of work in the Guizhou province? That's the several thousand. 
and even more people get these kind of job. Uh, today's uh, uh, risk uh, of AI is not because AI is too strong. It's not strong enough. Many dangerous uh, 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 things will happen because the weakness of the AI, uh, the safety problem and so on and so forth. So uh, the narrow AI should be further developed and uh, to, to, uh, uh, to be improved uh, more safety and uh, uh, for the future, if we talk about uh, AGI, the artificial general uh, intelligence, we need uh, some principles. Of the global uh, 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 consensus on the future uh, AI, uh, in which to which extent do we need uh, the, the super AI? In which fields? For, for which task we need it, and uh, what is the limitation for the further uh, the technology uh, development uh, and, and usage, we, we need some consensus and principles, I believe. Yeah, I'm, can, I, I'm can I just add one thing? Oh, I, sure. I, I think um, the real threat right now is an incredibly intelligent AI. I, I think the big risk is not advanced, weak, or, or dumb AI that oh, we man. think is really smart and putting too much faith into that. That's a huge risk, not the robots. So anyway, I'm very much relieved. I can keep my job until my retirement, so that <laughs> seems like it. So you know, the, yeah, um, actually that uh, you two already mentioned about a little bit, but you know, the, actually, Obvious AI, robot, and automation will, you know, make our lives much more convenient. That's obvious. But, you know, the also, you know, the we are actually afraid of that. Uh, I mean, we have more AIs and more robots around us. And that, that means, you know, that will deprive of uh, a lot of jobs. So, you know, the, I mean, so what do you think, I mean, the, about in that point, you know, the, all of us? I mean, wh what's your opinion about that? Yeah, actually, that uh, all right. So you know, the, we're gonna have a lot more AIs and robots around here. So you know, the, as as we have more AIs and robots, that mean, that means you know the, I mean that will take our jobs. You know, the, we're gonna use, a lot of people will lose jobs. You know, the, I mean in that sense, what do you think in the future? I mean, what shall we do? I mean, that's gonna be really actually a serious problem in the many developed countries right now. So what what's you you? Your opinions, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I had a chance to visit one factory in the southern part of Korean Peninsula, and only three years ago they hired uh, they are uh, manufacturing based companies, and they hired 1,400 uh, the people. But after three years with a smart factory, and they actually now have only 400 people. Mm -hmm. It means 1,000 people, maybe officially. They are fired, but they created another sub subsidiary companies to make the machines, so they rehired. So, uh, based on my observation, uh, maybe with the appropriate corporate strategy, uh, uh, maybe to utilize the potential of smart factories and AIs, and then maybe we can keep the, the employment. As so no problem, I don't, yeah, I think. I'd like to, to also point out that um, there is great diversity in jobs and the notion of jobs is changing. 10 years from now, we ha might have a completely different landscape and universe of jobs mm -hmm. that we consider as desirable. Having said that, the simple, repetitive, routine jobs that we have right now uh, that uh, AI can automate will definitely be lost. So I think there are, in the long term, I'm not as concerned, but in the short term, there's definitely concerns over how to utilize this relatively cheap labor that uh, you cannot easily turn or uh, change into other jobs or professions uh, because of their current education and their expertise. Um, so a couple of ideas that um, we came up with uh, at SK Telecom 
Uh, one of them is call center agents that uh, respond and interact with customer, customer complaints and questions and whatnot. There are a lot of routine questions, and we'd like for AI to be able to answer those questions. Um, but then the question comes, what, what do you do with these extra labor that is no longer necessary? Do you fire them? And I think the answer is no. You keep them to do two things. One is to train and educate and, um, and teach the AI how to respond better. The second thing is in that process, they become uh, effectively AI trainers or AI designers over time. So as the automation rate goes up, they can actually do two things. One is they can train and manage and monitor AI. They can, they can be managers of AI in the entire customer service realm. Second thing is actually they can be trained themselves to train other types of AI. So they also have an upgrade in terms of their profession and, uh, and vocation. The key word is changing. The job is going uh, uh, increased. Mm -hmm. If we look back to the 300 or 200 years of uh, modernization or industrialization, we get more and more jobs. But the question is for the individual, they should have the capability to changing their jobs. That's back to the education. We need to educate people to have transferable skills, not just to doing routine work uh, currently. So uh, 30 years ago even, or 40 years ago, we could not imagine there are millions of people doing software design. Mm -hmm. And robot is not born by mother. It is produced by many people for run one robot. So we need a lot of people to, to, to to get new jobs? That's the question. That is a challenge to uh, today's education system. Director Manning, you have something to add? Uh, some of the research that we've been doing looks at some of the most important skills when we're thinking about the next five, 10 years for people that might be out of a job or might have to transition. And some of those things are adaptability, the kinds of soft skills, being able to transition from one task to another. Because those are things that we know artificial intelligence isn't good at. Robots are not good at. So I think um, it's really important to, to not lose the importance of soft skills, understanding the, the the ability to add context, those are things that it will take a long time for robots to be able to do themselves. Actually, next question is uh, from uh, Ambassador Roy. Could you hand over the microphone to him? Kai Fu, uh, excuse me. Is this on? Uh, Kai Fu Lee in his book on artificial intelligence describes how intellectual property stolen from the United States in China is being ex exploited entrepreneurially, uh, creating a very competitive uh, environment, resulting in uh, real innovation in improving the stolen intellectual property. My question is, if intellectual property begins to be better protected in China, what will the impact be on this environment in China? Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, uh, today uh, in China, we have big discussion about data. Uh, and uh, uh, some province has made the provincial, we, we could not call it a provincial law, but it's a provincial regulations. Uh, uh, to protect the uh, privacy uh, and try to balance the benefit and the risk. So uh, we just we have noticed the last year in in in, in May, the European has uh, uh, released a very strict uh, so-called the general data protection rules, and that is uh, widely discussed in China how to. Uh, protect the privacy, uh, uh, how to uh, doing the big data responsibility, uh, responsible. Uh, so uh, thinking about AI, I think four uh, factors is very important. The first is the algorithm. The second is data. 
the third is uh, the, the computation power, and the fourth is application scenario. So the strength uh, today in China is the, the combination uh, of, of these four in China, especially for the application scenario, is quite open in, in, in China. So you see so many applications, different kinds of applications in China. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Unihong, I don't know the exact nu uh, number of China, but it's a relative big number in China, the Unihong, the, the AI related. So uh, on the one hand, that it is advantage uh, that's more uh, uh, free space for those people to 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 make innovation technical innovation uh, and entrepreneurship on the other hand people do worry about uh, the the loose regulation may uh, bring some uh, 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 dangers and uh, uh, try to have some uh, uh, regulation uh, early this year, uh, just uh, past the, the new year, I think the, the central government, uh, the People's Congress, also started a, a survey on the necessity of uh, 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 legislation works on AI. The progress uh, is started. Yeah, yeah. you want to add something? Yeah, yeah actually. Yeah, why don't you use your microphone, please? So uh, he indicated the importance of the copyright protection issue, and then maybe we wanted to share some insight from him yeah. about the copyright protection yeah. issue. Uh, the, the copyright, you know, uh, actually, uh, that is the one important factor between China and U.S. But as a, a university professor, I think the copyright is absolutely important, also not only for U.S., but also for Chinese, for Chinese uh, uh, technology developers, because only we have effective uh, uh, copyright that can protect the technical innovation and uh, make a, a fair competition. So uh, I'm absolutely uh, a pro uh, uh, copyright. Especially software copyright, this is so hard. So we we, we need a uh, 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 wider education to the Chinese people to respect to the copyright, and also we need technical tools to trace uh, the, the the behavior of using uh, the, uh, the the softwares with copyright. I believe. Actually, next question from floor is to. Uh Professor Lee, which is actually, I didn't, I, I mean, actually, I didn't have enough time to read this news article, but according to today's news article, Bloomberg evaluate and turn out to be South Korea is the number one in innovation area. <laughs> so, you know, the, especially, ab, now, st still you are fresh as a special advisor to Korean president <laughs> in the economy <laughs> and the science area. So, you know, the, could you comment, is it, is, you, do you agree with this? Uh <laughs> yeah, I should say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, as a <laughs> yeah, you should say that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, there's a, uh, a lot of things we have to improve. Uh, maybe uh, one thing is the regulation. Uh, the everything that is not forbidden should be allowed. So the, uh, that kind of thing is not a very common based on current regimes of uh, innovation regimes of the Korean industry. And in order to overcome that issue, uh, 11th of February, this Monday, Ministry of Industry got a kind of a, a committee to allow four uh, innovative uh, pilot programs to do, including uh, maybe uh, ICT related things. And also yesterday, also they uh, had another uh, committee to allow a pilot project, uh, they're initiated by Minister of in, uh, the Information and Communication, and including the AI-related applications. So those kind of things may have a kind of a chance to change the mood of the current society to accommodate more uh, innovative challenges, I guess. And then it 
maybe makes us to retain the ranking number one positions. <laughs> okay, thank you. So now the let's move on to last question, and uh, you know the all four of you. So you know the one of the I, I think as a scientist, the most uh, shocking news last year, 2018. I don't know what you think about the the most uh, shocking news. For me, was a uh, gene edited baby. Using CRISPR technology, Chinese scientists claim that uh, uh, he, he was able to actually use CRISPR technology, CRISPR-Cas9 technology to gene edit and then eventually add actually that, uh, you know, two babies, two or more than two babies were born. So this is really shocking news to me as a scientist. So you know, the, we have seen a lot of like I mean the you know as uh, Director Manny already mentioned about that there is uh, a lot of like I mean risk associated with the uh, new emerging technology including artificial intelligence robot a lot of different kinds of, like a uh, deep learning a lot of things there is a uh, always that obviously will make our life much more convenient and uh, you know the you know useful but still there is a huge risk. So you know, the, we have uh, like I mean the three speakers from each country, and also we have a company, you know, the like AI center director from SK, SKT. So you know, the, I want to ask you about uh, actually we need some kind of like a, you know some kind of like national government level each country you know should be in I mean the intervene that kind of like a process in somehow to rec have some make some regulations, not just uh, like uh, national-wide, but also international. Like uh, also we need uh, some kind of like uh, regulations or some common like uh, consensus on the, like I mean, the, this kind of like uh, new emerging technologies. So you know, the broadly speaking, why don't you give your opinion? You know, the start with, uh, you know, Professor Gong, a Chinese perspective, and then, you know, company perspective and American perspective, and finally, the Korean perspective, please. So, uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, the case happened at the end of last year in China. There are two uh, uh, gene-edited babies. Uh, it's already born. And uh, that is a serious case. And this is uh, 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 the violate uh, the, the, the uh, medical uh, ethics. Yeah, yeah, uh, ethical data line. A and uh, I think uh, there's a lesson we have to learn from this case is that for AI, we need uh, a set of rules based on the consensus, based on the uh, AI ethical principles in advance, and not when something happened. For example, if the killer robot is already produced and, 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 and used, so then we have, uh, uh, we got together to make the, the regulation. It's too late. We have to make this kind of work collectively worldwide uh, in advance to, to, to avoid these kind of things. So uh, I think uh, even though I'm not a, 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 a bioengineer, but we have to learn the lessons from this case. I guess from a corporate point of view, and, and maybe I'll expand on my analogies that I used in my talk to Jekyll and Hyde. And by the way, I think I got the Jekyll and Hyde thing flipped up, so I apologize. Um, Jekyll and Hyde uh, it actually resides in one body, in one being, in one character, in essence. And I think with AI, it's the same thing. There's, I don't think there's any such thing as a good AI or a bad AI. I think there is good and bad, uh, however you want to interpret it in your own terms. So for corporations, it's extremely important to have safeguards and uh, proactive measures at each point of research development and deployment to have checkpoints that are mathematically um, sound and rigorous and um, quantitative that can be measured, uh, as well as the qualitative. What's the process? Uh, how are the engineers and, and scientists and um, people who are in charge of deploying these things aware of such things? Because I think right now, uh, we don't have law enforcement for AI. And the reason is, 
if you arrest an AI, let's say if, if that's ever possible, um, that particular AI has no fault. It's been given data and instructions from the designers and the engineers and scientists who have um, instructed to do certain things very well. So there has to be that link back to whoever is in charge of a product, service, technology, uh, hardware, software that uh, contains an AI element. And I think the really, really difficult thing here is that um, software was something that was very hard for hardware engineers to grasp. AI is very difficult for software engineers even to grasp. Um, the boundary and lines and the, the entire picture of what an AI is and how that you know, is, can be identified is becoming more and more murky. Um, and so I think that there's a real technical challenge for technologists and there's uh, obviously a lot of challenges from a corporation, a corporate point of view, of how to enforce and make sure that in the final quality assessments of whether a product is shippable or not, or whether a product actually is beneficial, that element and uh, dimension has to be included. So uh, a lot of the response to the gene-edited babies from China was, was deeply emotional. So when people heard about what happened, uh, a lot of people were outraged. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I think is really important is that we, we understand that this response is an emotional response, and it's deeply rooted in our ideals and, and our understanding of what it means to be human, and, and that's very different from the US to China to different countries around the world. So I think um, instead of basing policy on emotional responses that are based in deep-rooted ideals, we need to have a scientifically informed conversation acknowledging the emotional responses, but then being able to explain that back and engaging the public in a way that they can understand what this policy actually means for them because this is such a deeply personal issue. So I think, um, spending so much time and the, the fear-mongering and the outrage is, is not as productive for this conversation. We really need to have a scientifically informed conversation and then be able to s explain it back. Yeah. Uh, there should be a cert certainly kind of a national committee to check uh, and make a good balance uh, the, uh, uh, for those kind of uh, new challenging tries and one of the key responsibility of that committee might be to make a due balance between economic benefit and ethical uh, and, and those kind of security or those uh, their non-economic issues. And so uh, I already indicated the example of the Korean uh, committee to allow the, the pilot programs and then uh, 11th uh, committee, they screened the 19 and allowed only four because of that issue. So uh, uh, we, need, uh, we need to have more strong uh, their kind of national committee. But I wanted to e emphasize the importance of global community. So for those issues, we need to have a kind of global governance, even though it is voluntary, but we need to kind, kind of uh, to have a global governance to check and share their consensus. And we need to participate on that. Thank you. Uh, with that, we have to wrap the wrap up the last session. And first, uh, I have to thank all four speakers for the wonderful presentation and discussions. And also, all all of you for staying to the end of this uh, like uh, conference. Thank you very much, all. Thank you.